On this edition of Native Report, we attend a unique fashion show displaying the beautiful creations of Delina White and her daughters. Learn about the Midewakanton Life Program, whose purpose is to create greater awareness, availability, and knowledge in CPR and automatic external defibrillators. And we meet the very talented multimedia artist Jonathan Thunder and learn about the personal themes that influence his art. We also learn about what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. The Great Lakes Woodland Skirt Project by Delina White is more than just a fashion show. It is a lesson in art, history, and culture. The show sets in motion an era when apparel changed dramatically for the Native people in the Great Lakes area. People who are photographers, either professional or personal or amateur or media. It is hours before the opening of the Great Lakes Woodland Skirts Fashion Show, and the models are busy prepping for the evening event. Delina White and her two daughters created the show. I wanted to, to do something to increase the awareness of the Great Lakes tribes. I know that when people think about Native American art, they think about the Southwest and turquoise and silver, and um, we have a large uh, community of Native people in the Great Lakes areas. Um, not only the Anishinaabe people, but the Ho-Chunk and the Meskwaki and the Wabanaki, the Mi'kmaq and the Mohawk and the Iroquois and Seneca, um, so forth and so forth. So we have our own history and I thought that it would be really interesting to talk about that. So I started doing research to find out the histor history about when um, beadwork became available and the types of materials that um, we traded with um, the voyagers. And so the materials became available to us at different times depending upon who brought the, the, the beads and who brought the silk ribbons and the satins and the cottons and all that. And, and we use them in ways that nobody else has ever used them. I think that this is a really phenomenal project. And when my mother approached me and asked my sister and I if we would want to partake in this, this big endeavor, we were really excited. At a young age, I started to bead and sew and my mother and grandmother, grandmothers have always been artists and I picked up the trade right away and, and I always wanted to create and, and do things. So that's been with me to this day. I'm very grateful for the way that my mother raised me. She always told me that if we go do beadwork instead of going hang out with friends all the time that we would be beautiful in the summer and we really wanted that. <laughs> so that's what we just kept telling ourselves that um, you know once we get this piece done we can move on to the next and when the summer comes we can just bloom like the flowers. As showtime comes around, it is standing room only at the Tweed Museum on the University of Minnesota Duluth campus. This is more than just a fashion show, it is a lesson in the history and culture of the Great Lakes region. We do a historical presentation, so I've done a lot of research and I brought with me tonight uh, photographs, historical photographs of um, Native women, Native woodland women um, of various tribes along the Great Lakes areas. And with them, um, the historical photos signify a certain uh, era in time, and with them they, are, they show examples of materials, um, different designs, um, different um, stitch work, skill level, 
all the various fashions. And what's really interesting is that there's a common thread between all of them, and that's because um, we all live in the same indigenous area of the Great Lakes area, so we share certain designs like the woodland floral, we share the fabrics and the fashion according to the different eras and time and the different materials that became available to us. That seems to be really a positive thing for our program that people are really liking that historical perspective to it. Um, I will show an image at the same time that the model comes out and then I tie that image into a particular facet about the skirt or the jewelry and then people can relate that image to the beaded accessories and the skirts that the models are wearing. I am so indebted to my models. Um, I just uh, love them dearly. They are friends and relatives of ours and we hand chose them because of their personalities and their characters and the way that they live their lives. They're wonderful women. They're mothers and grandmothers and aunties and daughters and um, their wonderful spirit just shines through and I tell them that when they wear the, the skirts they make the skirts come alive. They put their spirits into those skirts and without them the skirts are just fabric. The show was a true family effort, and as the evening comes to a close, the three women reflect on their efforts. It's been awesome because I feel like uh, they're experts in what they do, and I am lucky to be able to hear their opinions on, on my work as well. We're all very strong, opinionated um, women, and so we have our reasons for why we want to do things a certain way. And so when, when we um, try to give you know, advice to each other, sometimes we just have to expect that they're not going to listen. <laughs> We've all worked together on, on all of the projects. Um, my mother came to me about the blue dress. And I, I like to think of it as kind of a mermaid dress and she gave me the ideas about how she envisioned it. Of course, I envisioned it differently, and when I started cutting the pattern to make it, I'm like, okay, I get, I get what she means now. I know what she wants. And so um, we all put different skills into each of the projects. Um, I feel that we're kind of talented in different areas of our sewing, so, um, everyone had their bits and pieces and we'd all chime in on each other's work and sometimes we'd be like oh yeah that sounds good I'm gonna try it like that. It's been a, a learning experience it's been fun it's been exciting um, it's been very emotional it's been um, volatile and um, we've we've shared a lot of um, inspiration a lot of ideas uh, we work together very good um, I've got my dad who works close to or who lives um, near the girls so at midnight if I need a red ribbon I can call him <laughs> and we'll meet like 30 miles. Um, I'll go 30 miles, he'll go 30 miles and he'll give me the ribbon that either Lavender or Sage has and maybe I'll have a material that they need so he's been um, really uh, integral as part of you know the behind the scenes of getting things done. And I think it's really important that us as a culture of uh, Native women, that we continue to wear our skirts and that we wear them all the time in the workplace and at school um, as a way to show our culture. And not only at powwows and ceremonies and special occasions, but all the time. I'm Dr. Vinio, and today we'll be talking about high blood pressure or hypertension, which is usually defined as a blood pressure over 140 over 90. Blood pressures less than 120 over 80 are optimal. High blood pressure is often called the silent killer because it has no symptoms and is most often diagnosed on an office visit or sometimes after a stroke or a heart attack. Nearly one third of people who have high blood pressure don't know they have it. The top number is called the systolic blood pressure and is generated when the heart squeezes or contracts. The bottom number is the diastolic blood pressure and is the pressure in the blood vessels when the heart is resting between beats. Either number is concerning if it's too high. Risk factors for high blood pressure are alcohol use, smoking, obesity, 
family history, and diabetes. As blood vessels get narrowed and hardened by cholesterol, the resistance goes up. It's like sticking your finger over a garden hose to make it spray farther. Blood vessels are pipes and tubes and they can get damaged from too much pressure just like a bike tire or a power steering hose on your car. An aneurysm is a ballooned out blood vessel caused by too much pressure. In addition to heart attacks and strokes, high blood pressure can cause eye damage and kidney failure. High blood pressure is also among the common causes of erectile dysfunction. High blood pressure can cause left ventricular hypertrophy. This happens when the left side of the heart gets big and dilated and doesn't pump very well. It can lead to congestive heart failure, which is pulmonary edema or water in the lungs. What can you do? Well, weight loss, diet, exercise, and cutting out alcohol and non-ceremonial tobacco use are the best preventions for complications. There are many blood pressure medicines available and your provider will help you choose the one best suited to you. Remember, high blood pressure usually doesn't have any symptoms and many people with high blood pressure don't even know they have it. The only way to find it before it causes a problem is to have your blood pressure checked and the best time to treat it is right away. Email me if you have any questions you would like answered here. My email address is at the bottom of the screen. Call an elder. They've been waiting to hear from you. I'm Dr. Vinio, and this is Health Matters. To date, thanks to Metawakan and Public Safety, hundreds of automatic external defibrillators have been donated to civic organizations, governmental bodies, schools, and in hundreds of locations throughout the state of Minnesota. Next, we learn more about this successful donation program. The call for emergency services may come at any time for Midwakanton public safety personnel. For those suffering from cardiac arrest, time is key. And the use of an automated external defibrillator, or AED, can mean the difference between life and death. The faster that we can get that individual help, whether it's CPR and an AED, the better chance that they have to live. And for us, it is a response time. We're fortunate in our community, our average response time is two minutes and 34 seconds. From time of call to time our crews are, are with that patient. The more that the AEDs and people learn CPR, the, be you know, the better we can help each other um, and, and help in those times where somebody, you know, somebody's having a medical emergency and, and they stop breathing or their heart stops and we have a great opportunity to save them. They come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, what you'll find is pretty much by a, about two foot by two foot, oh, by about, oh, I'd say 18 inches deep, um, red or green looking unit hanging on a wall in a public location. But they do the same thing, whether a surgeon implants one or whether we, uh, we bring one and, and put the pads on somebody, it's really the same thing. We're there to des design to try to restart the heart when, it's, when its electrical activity has been interrupted. At least 28 lives have been saved using an AED since 2004 when the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux community began their life program that promotes the knowledge of CPR and the use of AEDs. The program also donates AEDs to tribes, schools, police and fire departments, nonprofits, and other organizations across the nation. Pretty much every reservation in Minnesota has gotten it. State patrol, um, local police, nursing homes, schools, churches. I personally delivered one to um, an elderly community out in uh, Oregon, uh, town of Yahats, Oregon, where my mom lives. I delivered one out there. Um, the people that request these, they're needed in their communities because they don't have any other way to get them. And an AED is such a life-saving device that they should be in every police car and every, every fire and emergency vehicle they can get into. They should be in any commercial building where you can get easy access to them. It was just a, a chance meeting with uh, some state patrol a bunch of years ago, it was about 2005, 2006. I started chit-chatting with them and we realized that you know, the, the police vehicles didn't have these AEDs. So we were able to go back to the council and speak with the council about it and that's when everything started snowballing from there. This is a Heart Start Automatic External Defibrillator. These are the same ones that we give out through our, uh, through our program. Uh, when we hand them out, they're good to go right off the bat. Um, if someone was to fall and have a heart attack right outside, we could take this and use it on them. Uh, they're as simple as open it up, and as soon as you open up, you turn them on. Remove clothes from patient's chest. These things will walk you through on how to use them. They're easy enough that a child can use them. 
Uh, they come preloaded with the pads already. Um, these are the same pads that would come with it. On the pads, they show where they go on the chest, so it's, it's very, very simple to use. A lot of these also come with what's called a child's key, and that's what this is right here. We take a child's key, we put it in here, and should a, a young infant or a child have a heart issue, we're able to use these pads on them also and use the machine. What the key does is it, it, tur it turns down the um, power that comes from this, so they won't get such a big shock. When you donate them to uh, businesses, they also get a cabinet that goes upon the wall. It uh, has our logo on the front and it has a big sign on it so people can see where they're at. Because the best part about these is to have them where people see them so they can be accessed and used at will. The Shakopee Midwak Tensu community has AEDs situated in all of its facilities and enterprises. They have been used on several occasions, most notably at Dakota Sports and Fitness. The first major one that we had was in 2013 and a 40-year-old gentleman had dropped in the locker room after working out. He had no pulse. They started doing compressions. They got through about two rounds of com compressions at the time when one of the employees had run back to the fitness desk area to grab our AED. When they came back, got it hooked up, um, had shocked the gentleman twice, and at that time, Medfire arrived and they've got a unit that does um, hook up automatic compressions and found a weak pulse and they were able to transport him to Abbott for a stint for a fully clogged artery and he survived. When I started the AD program, the Medwalkington Life program really just started to, to gain its legs. We had donated uh, AEDs and put them into all of the state patrol vehicles, and, and that was a, a really excellent visionary idea from former leadership within our organization to uh, our former chairman, Stanley Crooks, Glenn Crooks, and Keith Anderson. We just gave away our 900th AED uh, to Excelsior Fire District, and we've actually have already exceeded 900 with a recent uh, donation to the Dakota County Sheriff's Office. We're in a position where we can give back to the community and our surrounding communities, and if we can do that, why don't we? Um, Native people, we've always tried to take care of everyone that we can, and this is just another way for us to give back and help take care of other people. I see a little one running around here. Uh, what, what, what do you hope for that two-year-old in your family? What do you hope for those young people here? I hope that they can get an education, go on, hold on to their Indian heritage as they're doing that. Sometimes that's hard to do because when you go out, you branch out into um, a world off the reservation and off uh, away from your own people. Sometimes it's hard to hold on to that. But um, that's what I'm hoping for them, that they will get an education, go out in the world, and try to tell people the story. So many things are not written down, and they're handed down, you know, it's an oral language, and we need, we need other people to be able to, uh, to hear these stories. And some people don't want to hear them, you know, it, it's, and I'm sure that's common. The artwork of Jonathan Thunder explores the personal themes of identity, life transitions, internal conflict, and self-transformation. For Jonathan, his artwork is a record of personal evolution. Nice thick texture. Jonathan Thunder knew from an early age that he wanted to be an artist, and having the support of his family and encouragement from his teachers help push this personal ambition. I think I first realized that I wanted to be an artist uh, around the third grade. I remember getting a, an assignment where we had to draw a smiley face and a, a sad face. It was real basic. And uh, I went home and my mom said, here, just do it like this. And she just went 
you know, and there was a happy face and a smiley face. And from that point forward, I always drew. I always had a sketchbook. Around the seventh grade, um, I started working on paintings and uh, just took a different approach. I always wanted to do something other than, this is probably co common with artists in art school, but they always want to do what's different than the rest of the classroom. We had a calligraphy lesson. So we had this India ink and these tools and uh, everybody was working on their penmanship and I gave myself a tattoo and the uh, instructor actually gave me a credit for it too. So she really supported me on that and she just kind of let me be who I, who I wanted to be. And um, you know, it was, just, it was just open game after that. I was told that my, uh, my grandma knew how to paint on my mom's side or uh, draw rather. And my mom, she never really took to it, but I knew that when I, you know, when backed into a corner, she could draw something. And that's kind of where I got my influence from. I just remember being really inspired by seeing one of her drawings when I was in the third grade. And at that point, moving forward, I just said, I want to be an artist. There are paintings that she can stand behind. And uh, I guess they probably, um, you know, don't raise as much concern for her. I've had uh, one show actually was in question as to whether it could be shown at the venue because there was guns and nudity in the, some of the paintings. And uh, those are the kind of paintings where, you know, she'll be like, there's something going on with you, boy, you know. And uh, the other stuff that's, you know, for me, it's like when I'm in a place of beauty and I just want to make something, you know, that's very enlightening. Those are the paintings that she really gets behind. Some works are whimsical, some are literal, and some are social commentary. But no matter how controversial Jonathan's artwork may or may not be, all of it is thought-provoking. For my painting life, a lot of my stuff is a little more personally structured, like it comes from, you know, someplace in the heart. I get hired to uh, tell our creation stories and uh, do stuff that carries the language. And um, that's been a blessing that I did not expect. I didn't see that coming in my career, you know, and I, I didn't even plan for it. Somewhere along the way, probably my fine art training, I got, I took a more artistic approach and that led me into the creating uh, the short stories with uh, some filmmakers that can actually hire me to do those. Hey John, I'm looking at your easel and I see the, you know, the, the common end of the trail thing going, but I think you changed it up a bit. What do you, what do you got going here? Yeah, this is a piece that I'm creating for the, uh, art show that's curated by Wendy Savage. It's about keeping tobacco sacred. In this piece, I've done a little studying of the uh, traditional end of the trail image, which uh, I've been told is not exactly flattering to uh, natives in the country and sort of like our colonization. I flipped it in this one. I got a, a Marlboro man and he's sort of, uh, he's at the end of his trail. You know, I put a little satire in there. He's got some arrows in his back. Uh, the horse that you see here is gonna be sort of skeletal. And um, down here, underneath the ground, I'm gonna have a little bit of maybe some floral patterns. And uh, the skull just kind of signifies, um, you know, maybe bringing back our culture. Jonathan has made a name for himself across Indian country, but having created the animation for the 2015 World Indoor Lacrosse Championship opening ceremony, his work is now seen internationally. They wanted to do something really nice because the world would be watching. Is the Onondaga creation story and how it leads up to lacrosse, the gift of lacrosse. It was projected in the arena at the beginning of the uh, ceremony for eight minutes, which led into, um, you know, they gave an a opening prayer and uh, introduced the teams from 13 nations. For me, it was, uh, it was just an experience that I wouldn't even known how to, you know, like try to seek that out. Do I see myself as an artist that's Native American or do I see myself as a Native American that's an artist? I remember at a stage where I was like, I'm just an artist, you know, but I'm, I've always been Native and I've always 
been, I've always come from that place. So no matter what I do, it's always gonna be in my work. All of my work is a self-portrait of who I am. It's in one way or another, it reflects where I'm at in life. And uh, whether the subject is an animal or a female character uh, or a mix, it basically all talks about where, where I'm at in life. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Join us next week for another Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Partial funding for this episode of Native Report is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.